Shalom, shalom. You're listening to a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. My name is Ari Ben Lyman Hanavi. Let's take the next 30 minutes and work our way through this passage in Isaiah 9, verse 6. We are comparing and contrasting the biblical Unitarian perspective of God in these verses against the Trinitarian perspective of the same verses. Biblical Unitarian is a non denominational i'm sorry it's a christian um denomination non-trinitarian christian denomination that believes that god is one and only one he's a unipersonal god there is no god but him he's the only god he is the god that is mentioned in the old testament as yahweh and he is synonymous with the name of the person the singular person mentioned in the new testament as the god of jesus so god the father and yahweh are uh, numerically one person and there's only one person yes he has personhood he has personality he is a person he's not a thing and yet there's only one of them and he is the only one he's not broken up into three persons father god son god holy spirit god or anything like that in fact, in the Biblical Unitarian model, which is more or less synonymous with Unitarianism, although Biblical Unitarian makes its own distinction against um, uh, traditional Unitarianism, uh, uh, in its more, which is a little bit more liberal, which embraces even some of the other truths from other religions. At least I, I highly respect Biblical Unitarian for being a bit more conservative and taking the stance that they do on um, uh, limiting their view to what the Bible says. I, I like that. I really I, and, I, and I applaud them. But who is Jesus in their view? Jesus is the human agent sent by God into the world to become the savior of the world. He's the only name, as we read about in the book of Acts, the only name, he ha- He bears the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the name we must call upon. And thus, when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, we do enter into a relationship with God, but it's through Jesus, the Son, the man named Jesus, who now sits at the right hand of power. He has been exalted by God, and therefore he must be worshipped, but not as God. He must be worshipped as the Son. He must be worshipped as Messiah, as Christ, as Lord, but not as God. So don't get confused, Biblical Unitarian tells us. He is human. He's altogether human. What do they do with the Holy Spirit? As I keep flashing on the graphic that I'm using for this particular segment, that that shows up in post-production, but not for those of you who are in my Skype class. The Holy Spirit is the um, power of God. It is another name for God himself. God the Father is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is simply God. However, um the bible also tells us that god can send his spirit into the hearts of true believers to uh empower us as kind of an impersonal force um and yet the relationship they have with god is not impersonal i don't believe that biblical unitarian describes their relationship with god in that manner but it the um definition of the impersonal nature of the spirit of god bears a resemblance to the Jehovah's Witnesses who describe the power, the uh, here, Holy Spirit in personal pronouns like it instead of he. And so they depersonalize him and turn him into an object, something that's a bit offensive to me and other Trinitarians. But Biblical Unitarian being non-Trinitarian, um, they, I do, I, I'm, I'll have to go back and read their verbiage one more time on the Holy Spirit. But for the now, I definitely can say that they believe that the Holy Spirit is another name for God himself, who is pure spirit and who is altogether holy. Thus, calling God Holy Spirit is nothing unusual for the Bible. So, that's where we're at. Looking at their rest, at their uh, resource at biblicalunitarian.com, a website about God and his son Jesus Christ, we're looking and examining looking at and examining Isaiah 9, 6. And from their perspective, their basic view is, and I keep forgetting to provide my summary that I created of their of this particular answer. I'll do it in time. I have it somewhere, but I, I created this just a short one little paragraph summary of their answer of why they believe this passage is not talking about Jesus um, as very God, but they do believe he's talking about Jesus. So let me read the passage for you one more time. I'll read it in English and in Hebrew, and then I'll just uh, tell you what their perspective is. And I'm going to borrow, well, may not do that. Let's borrow their version, 
that the one they prefer to use, which is the REV, the Revised English Version, which is available online for free at revisedenglishversion.com. It reads, Isaiah 9, 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will call his name Wonderful Counselor, Mighty Hero, Father of the Coming Age, Prince of Peace. And if you notice, when it gets to the four names, the father who's naming the child is giving the names in such a way that it does not allow for or need to include any divinity or deity. A wonderful counselor can be a human being. A mighty hero can be a human being. A father of the coming age can also be a human. And when we're talking about Jesus, according to the biblical Unitarian interpretation, Jesus is the father of the coming age, namely the messianic age in opposition to the um whatever age the current age that isaiah was writing in uh kind of a dispensational uh, identifier where the age of israel would have been a kind of the age of law and the coming age the messianic age would be the law of grace something like that and the fact that jesus is the one whose blood is poured out so that the messianic age can be a reality which we also affirm as trinitarians Thus, Biblical Unitarian comes along and says, to call him Father is not to confuse him with his own Father God, because we qualify by saying coming age, even though we're going to find out here in the Hebrew, the word coming is not actually in the Hebrew, it's supplied by context or supplied by interpretation by this particular version of the Bible. But the last title, Prince of Peace, it can also be applied to a human being. So what do we make of the original English, I'm sorry, the original Hebrew, as is reproduced by a Trinitarian interpretation like NASB, which is the one I've been borrowing for the most part. Here's the way it reads, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, so that's the same. Mighty God, well, that's different. What happened to Mighty Hero? Well, Trinitarian versions such as the NASB say, no, let's give him the title God because we're going to find out in the Hebrew that the word translated for God, the Hebrew is El, a shortened form of Elohim. This word does mean God in some contexts, as in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, Elohim, God created that's certainly not a human being and there's certainly no devil or angel or high priest or anything like that it is definitely god by context so the word elohim can mean god and most naturally it does mean god but context allows for it to mean uh, a host of other meanings as well besides just god any other mighty um being or person or that's why biblical unitarian opts for mighty he or eternal um uh, mighty hero but the next one, Eternal Father, is rooted in the literal Hebrew, which is Aviad, um, Father of the Age or Father of Eternity, something to that effect, without having to insert the word, um, what do they say? Coming Age or something like that. And then the last one, Prince of Peace. And these interpretations are important for us to consider because Biblical Unitarian shares an affinity with Rabbinic Judaism when it comes to rejecting Jesus as God, but they break from Rabbinic Judaism by embracing Jesus as Messiah. And so when it comes to the interpretations, if we compare, before I jump into the Hebrew, if we look at the comparison of Biblical Unitarian with Rabbinic Judaism, using the revised JPS 2023 version of the Bible that I have pulled up for us on safaria.org. Rabbinic Judaism translate this Hebrew as, For a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and authority is settled on his shoulders. He has been named the mighty God is planning grace. Nothing about, um, uh, uh, what, uh, what is it, everlasting, uh, what, what did they say? Sorry, I keep forgetting. Um, where is it? Here we go. Wonderful counselor, mighty hero. No. Um, uh, rabbinic Judaism says, says the mighty God is planning grace, which is really like a, um, a commentary on the passage. It's like a, an extended paraphrase. Um, the mighty God is planning grace, the eternal father, a peaceable ruler. So the reason these translations are relevant for our discussion is because rabbinic Judaism, by changing the titles of the child to exclude any possibility of it referencing Jesus, 
they simply focused the prophecy back onto a human ruler, namely Hezekiah or some Manasseh or something like that. Whereas, by contrast, biblical Unitarianism, even though they share many similarities with rabbinic Judaism in their strict monotheistic view of who the Messiah will be and their understanding of who God is, biblical Unitarianism does in fact embrace Jesus as Messiah. They are Christian and therefore their version of the Bible of this translation of this verse in the, in the uh, titles must include some reference to Jesus. And so they do that by calling him the father of the coming age and the prince of peace, as opposed to in the rabbinic Judaism version, it just says the eternal father, a peaceable ruler. The eternal father there is um, closer to the original Hebrew that we're going to read here in a moment. So, important to understand the, the similarities and distinctions between rabbinic Judaism, biblical Unitarian, and standard Trinitarian theology. So, having said that, let's read now the Hebrew over on the right side of my page here, which is right there. It says, Ki yeled yulad lanu ben nitan lanu vat hi hamisra al shikmo. And as I keep mentioning, the four names are translated by Trinitarians as being a very faithful, true uh, representation of what the Hebrew literally says, the wonderful counsel, the, the um, Pele Yoetz, and the um, mighty God, the El Gibor. El being short for Elohim, El Gibor, the mighty God, the eternal father, Avi Ad, without having to add any extra wording such as father of the coming age. We simply have father of the age. The word Ad can refer to age or eon or eternity, eternal father, father of the age, something to that effect. And then the last one, prince of peace, Sar Shalom. So that's the way it reads in the Hebrew. Let's turn now to Dr. Brown's notes as he answers the rabbis on their objections on this child being Messiah. We're um, comparing and contrasting Biblical Unitarian's view, but we're borrowing Dr. Brown's notes, who is the world's foremost um, Messianic Jewish apologist. Uh, on these particular matters. That doesn't mean he's the smartest man in the room, but he did literally write the book. So let me at least show you this. He literally wrote the book on answering Jewish objections to Jesus. It's a five volume set. It's available on his web resource at thelineoffire.org. And so I'm plugging his resource at the moment. Um, just click on any link that looks like a link to the store and you can find his resources there or just do a search using the search our store feature there and using the upper right corner the book is a five volume set and if you buy it from dr brown's um website here it's very important that you notice that at the time of this recording which is april 28th 2024 the five volume set there are only two left of the full five volume set yeah, I'm giving you a plug here, Dr. Brown. Um, five volume set for a deal of $99. Basically, one of the books is free. They're each $25 each. When I bought them, I paid the full price for all five. So he's lowered it from $125 for the five volume set down to $99.99 for the complete five volume set. Only two left at that price. All right, uh, let's turn out to his resource. What we've been reading is his answer to rabbinic Judaism's rejection of trinitarian theology particularly isaiah's promise and prophecy of a child who's going to come forth into the history of israel who will be a descendant of his father david and yet will have a unique um, perspective on his the, the rulership of his kingdom and exactly what he's going to accomplish when he is born and so what we've been learning is that Using the lens of a hermeneutic known as prophetic telescoping, we can uh, understand that the prophet is describing a king who would arrive on the scene in a short amount of time after giving the prophecy, and this king would be an earthly king. He would be someone that Israel could see and interact with and would accomplish some of the parts of the prophecy. We call that partial fulfillment in the term uh, in the scope of prophetic telescoping it's like the first of a small mountain peak that you're seeing in post-production of a um 
mountain peak where a prophet on the far left of the side is looking at the first mountain peak it's smaller and yet as he views the, the prophecy you can see the line drawing from the prophet on the left side extending to the far right side of the graphic that you're looking at the blue and white graphic the the larger mountain peak is separated by this valley between the two peaks and so the smaller peak is the near fulfillment and the larger peak is the far fulfillment or the the final fulfillment and yet, yet from the prophet's perspective, because of kind of an optical illusion created by what you can reproduce in real life, if you stand um, far enough away from any mountain peaks that are separated by a valley, you might not be able to distinguish which mountain peak is which. They might overlap with one another. There's a bit of, bit of um, uh, equivocation or uh, ambiguity or conflation going on where it looks like one mountain peak is essentially another mountain peak that's just a little larger behind it. Or they might be one on top of the other, or you don't know the distance between the two peaks themselves. You might be aware that there's two. Either way, the prophets often wrote about one ruler in partial fulfillment that would take place in Israel's time period within a generation, per se at the same time pointing their prophecy to a farther total fulfillment in the future, namely King Jesus, Messiah himself. So what we've been doing is interacting with Dr. Brown's notes with uh, rejection of rabbinic Judaism's rejection of Jesus as this candidate. And we parked ourselves at this uh, commentator by the name of Troche. And um, uh, we're going to back up just one um, paragraph to get a running start from where I left off last week. So here's what Dr. Brown has to say. He talked about Troche's interpretation. He's a rabbinic Jew, by the way, Troche. Troche's rabbinic interpretation of who the figure is. And according to Troche, which is typical of rabbinic Judaism, the figure is not Jesus. Although, when it talks about the scope of the reign of this figure... It's simply figurative. It's not literal when it talks about how long this child is going to reign. And that's one big key factor that should be driving our interpretation to understanding the passage, because the passage talks about that of his reign, there will be no end. Of his rulership, it will be without end. You know, everlasting father, right? Avi Ad. So what do we make of that? 